Dave. Hi, Dave Keith. Here. Welcome. Hello. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, great. I'm going to step out. Trevor's going to do a bit of an introduction and uh, I'll be setting up the Slido for any questions about your presentation. Awesome. Yeah, Keith, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited when we were looking at the schedule, um, you know, we tried to have a mix of, of course, the lower level sort of deep in the browser, but then also all the way up through, you know, why are those things even important? How do those things manifest themselves into the world? And I think building a virtual museum is a great example of how, you know, the technical decisions sort of down the stack sort of make their way up into experiences like you've been creating. So I'm very excited about hearing what you have to say today. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you. And I've watched all the talks and it's been so amazing today just to see everybody and uh, learning so much about this thing that I really like learning about. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I will duck out and I will turn it over to you. All right. All right, there is my talk. So it is called Building a Virtual Museum, Having Fun and Also Getting Paid. So who am I? I'm Dr. Keith Chan. I teach biological anthropology in community colleges in the San Diego area. So this topic involves a lot of things. It's things related to human biology, human evolution, genetics, and it goes into monkeys and apes and fossils. So it, it's a lot of stuff that it's, I really like teaching. And through learning how to teach biological anthropology, I've made this thing called Anthropometron. So what is that? In short, is a virtual anthropology museum. And it's accessible from VR headsets, of course, uh, which is the, the most immersive experience, but it's also accessible on desktop browsers and even smartphone browsers. And even though with a small screen, you'd think that people wouldn't like it, but people actually do like that. Uh, they say it's like they're filming the museum, uh, which I never thought of it that way before. So the main features, uh, there's two things I like to include. Uh, one is a set of scale models of primates, uh, both modern day and prehistoric. So you see some there in the centerpiece of the museum. The other thing I include is a set of grabbable artifacts and skulls, again, of uh, different primates. And it really, especially in VR, when you actually pick up these things and compare them and look at them from all angles, that is a really great experience. There's some pictures from around the museum. Of course, I encourage you to visit it uh, after this summit is over. There's cute modern primates like tarsiers, these are some of the artifacts. They show different stone tool styles and you can pick those up in VR, and swing them around. Uh, there's other artifacts like pottery and I include other information such as this uh, painting of, of these extinct woodpeckers, which are also what is engraved on that pot. So uh, really finding resources, which I'll get into to really tie in uh, these different items. There are also prehistoric primate models. So there's no primate like this living today, uh, but you can see what a prehistoric proconsul uh, could have looked like. And more side content is a model I found, and talk about that later, of a castle in Spain. And it's related to a actual human burial. There's a burial of a knight that was found in there. Uh, and you can see that model, and then you can see the castle where he was buried. So why did I do all this? Uh, well, there's a few reasons. It goes all the way back to 2015 when I started teaching biological anthropology. And I was really frustrated that I couldn't convey the scale of things, like how tall is uh, Lucy, how large is a howler monkey, that it, I just use my hands and it doesn't really help. And I kind of didn't know either. Like I've never seen one in real life. It, and so it's hard for me to convey that information. There's things like this cardboard cutout uh, which helps, but there's only so many of those. Uh, there's that picture of me with a gorilla uh, stand up, and there's only so many of those. And so I was really frustrated with this, uh, this thing I just couldn't really convey in my class. So a solution came up in May of 2019 when I got an Oculus Quest. It was on release because it's near my birthday, which is in the end of May in a few days. Uh, and it really blew me away. Like this is a great VR device. And I did things like use the Wander app where you can uh, go into these Google Street View scenes as presented in VR. So this is a natural history museum in Vienna, Austria. And it's so cool looking. I spent hours in these museums uh, just 
while, while also being uh, where I live. So I got thinking, what if I made my own museum? It wouldn't be as, as cool as this one, as photorealistic, and that's actual photos. Uh, but what if I can make my own museum that's tailored for my course? By August 2019, I'd done enough online research for the available tools out there where I could start working on my own virtual museum. And so that's when I started the Anthropometrian project. I worked on it for a semester, and it was released at the start of 2020. Of course, I have to mention another event that happened around then. Uh, by March, the pandemic had really hit and really influenced uh, lives across the world. And it made museums like this inaccessible to, to everybody. So the virtual space really took off in importance and in people's minds uh, due to the pandemic. It made me work harder on this uh, as my outside time was suddenly limited. All right, so this section and what this talk is gearing towards is how to make your own museum. Uh, because I found that it, the tools were actually very accessible and the process was very enlightening. So to sell you on this idea, why make your own virtual museum, there's a few reasons, especially if you're an educator. One is it makes you better at, at education, that you enhance the classroom education and enhance online education as well. You can convey things you couldn't otherwise with what you had uh, just in a typical classroom. Now for Anthropometron, sometimes I do bring in the VR headset, especially to office hours, but I also just show it on a projector. And just from that view, they get a sense of, of how large and small these different items are. It also increases the accessibility of this information. If you have one of these devices or you can get your hands on one of these devices like through the school's library, then you can browse this museum and, and hopefully learn from it. Now, there's other benefits. It's fun. Uh, I've had a great time in, in the past two years working on this museum. Uh, it taps into this investigative element of fun where I get to read scientific papers about slow lorises, which I'm trying to model right now. Uh, that doesn't sound fun to a lot of people, but it really, it's really, it's fun digging into this information uh, that scientists have, have discovered. Uh, maybe more relatable is I get to see every slow loris picture that's on the internet. So that's also a, a great use of my time. And there's also another element of the fun, which is the creative side. So making my own slow loris model uh, based on these pictures, based on scientific reports and, and seeing that progress. All right, so how did I make it? Uh, well, uh, if you're attuned to different web frameworks, you might kind of see some resemblance in this uh, to A-Frame. So A-Frame is an open source a web framework that puts VR in web browsers of different devices. Uh, the main site is aframe.io. And from there, they have really uh, easy to follow tutorial uh, layouts, this A-Frame school, you can see the specific link there. And it guides you through the basics of having your own scene, uh, going to a place to host it called uh, glitch.com. There was a mention of them early on today. And having your own playground is literally a playground where you can play with the objects there uh, and add things of your own like I have done there. Uh, so going back to these three cylinders, I said it might look familiar because uh, it looks like that starting A-frame scene. I just changed those shapes to cylinders and I made them the height of different prehistoric primates. And I was super pleased with myself already at that stage. All right, so if you want more than cylinders in your uh, museum, there's some sources of models that you could tap into. Uh, one is the expanding set of Creative Commons models that are out there. And so there's three main places. And I should mention that Creative Commons is uh, this type of licensing where creators of, of items uh, put it up for use on the internet uh, with uh, some rules to follow, like, uh, like citations uh, and promise not to monetize them and things like that. So it's per object, uh, but it allows you in some way to use other people's work uh, in, a, in a totally legal manner. And so the three uh, big places are Sketchfab. Uh, my mini factory has this program called Scan the World where uh, people have scanned a lot of cultural heritage items, a lot of wonderful looking statues, especially uh, in there. And the Smithsonian Institution has their own uh, open access uh, collection where some of their items they have uh, scanned and they have 2D images as well. 
that are available to be used. Uh, and see this array of objects. These are all Creative Commons items found somewhere on the internet and, and uh, the, that represent things I talk about in my course. Another source is uh, my own models, and that means you can make your own models as well. Uh, this gets into Blender, and Blender's had a few mentions today. And as always, it's followed with, it's kind of difficult to get into. Uh, well, there's a solution for that, which is YouTube tutorials. Uh, for basically anything you need to do with Blender, any dream you have of 3D modeling, there's at least three tutorials that uh, address that topic. So for my goals, uh, there is a tutorial for low poly animals, and I followed that over and over, and I worked along with it. Uh, so this is just going through that process of having photo references and sketching out the shape, uh, getting more and more details in, put, putting it in my scene to see how it looks there. And then, as they say, finish the rest of the owl to the finished product. And with tutorials like this, uh, it, it really helps because People have spent a lot of time recording these things, and they're really good at conveying how to get Blender to do exactly uh, what you have in mind. So onto some logistics of making your own museum. Uh, let's talk about money for educators, because uh, while I do find a lot of joy making this museum, it's nice that there is some material uh, uh, gain as well. So there's uh, some sources of, uh, of funding for this, uh, that is, is typical to educational institutions. Uh, one is professional development money. So this is, if you're an educator, you know, uh, at the start of every semester, you have to do a certain number of hours of things like meetings and other things that are there to enhance your teaching ability. And so this enhances your teaching ability. And my school, uh, Miracosta College, uh, they have been very welcoming in my idea of getting funding to work on this project and, and, and build it up over semesters. There's another possible source, which is just a general teaching fund that departments may have uh, that you have to write a short proposal to uh, the chair of your department about uh, getting some funding for resources. So if you want to take a pay course for Blender or A-Frame, which those are out there as well, uh, and you think those will help you, then you can get funding for that, books as well. Uh, I don't know about shooting for the VR headset, but go ahead and try. Uh, all they can say is, Mm -mm. Uh, so uh, some caveats to uh, uh, getting funding is that uh, this isn't really extra money. Like This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme for educators to uh, get into VR. But this is pay you have gotten otherwise for professional development. So you're choosing, instead of getting paid to, to watch meetings, you might have seen them all already if you've been at school for a while, then you're uh, choosing to work on this side project to enhance your, your teaching. And also the pay may not ma match the effort. So uh, they go strictly by the hour of professional development. You might have cylinder world, which is cool, uh, but you probably won't have super detailed models and, and a, a lot of bells and whistles, as they say. Uh, so they're, they're saying, not, I'm not telling you how to switch career paths to be a 3D modeler, but they're something to add your, to your educational career path. Keith, uh, so some uh, tips I have. Keith, thank you so much. We're oh. going up uh, towards the end. Do, okay, you sure. some, uh, do you have a summary or? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my I try a new sub and there's no timer. Uh, so thanks for telling me. So there's some, tricky, sure. some tips uh, that you can read. And in conclusion, uh, the VR is a really great space to get into and uh, for developing skills and educating students about any kind of topic, not just biological anthropology. And people are super nice. There's a lot of resources out there that you can get into. All right, so go ahead and get started. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. Yeah, thank that's you, awesome. Keith. Yeah, I was just going to say, I've tried this and it's amazing. I think it was one of the first uh, WebXR experiences that I tried. Ben Irwin took me in and I thought it was it was so good. Um, before we pass you over to uh, pass over and introduce you to Diego, quick question. Have you had any students try out your experience yet? Because that uh, was one yes. of the questions. Oh, yeah? awesome. Yeah, I, I have students do it. Uh, as an extra credit exercise, because depending on their access to devices, I have, I have had good feedback. And some students are into 3D modeling themselves. So that gives us something 
further to connect to you and talk about our own experiences during that. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much on behalf of the WebXR Developer Summit team for joining us here today and from the community for sharing your knowledge and presentation.